pray with me. Father, we, we thank you for this evening and this time to gather together, uh, to set our hearts um, in, a, in a better place in, in many ways than maybe where they've been throughout this day or throughout this week, uh, to focus on what is of first importance. And so pray that you would draw us in this evening draw us into the grand and beautiful story that is the gospel, that is told from the first page to the last of our scriptures. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together tonight, and we do pray that in all that we do and say, and that you would be glorified not just here now, but maybe as we're with family or other things going on tonight and certainly tomorrow in a very different year. Lord, we pray that you would be blessed, that you would be glorified. Thank you again for all that you've given us in the gospel and draw us near to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there are some years, I think, where it seems as though good news is a bit more important than other years. And I think most of us would agree that 2020 might very well fit that bill. Even as we're in the midst of celebrating Christmas, there likely have been questions running through many of our minds as to how should we actually do that? Should we get together with our family? If we do, how should we do it? And how do we help our kids understand all that's been going on and how it has changed so much about how life has been done this year? How do we help ourselves understand it all and sort through what's been a pretty crazy year? But right now, you're here or you're watching online. So take a breath. Though life has been hectic and unpredictable, and there's probably still more hectic to come, maybe even later tonight or tomorrow when you're with family or trying to figure out all the celebration and how it works. But this is a chance to stop and just slow down to bring those difficulties, the pain, the heartache, the disappointments, the frustrations to the only place that they can actually be handled. Now, each Christmas Eve, I take up a series called The Hymns of Christmas, where what I do is just take a few minutes and meditate on one of the songs of the season. It's a time to consider what these time-honored anthems and carols communicate. We sing them each year. We hear them on the radio, sometimes starting a little bit too early. But too often we don't slow down enough to truly hear the message and let it sink into our hearts. It's, it's maybe become too familiar. And tonight, I'm going to look at one that we probably all love. It's a tune that's stirring. It's the sound of Christmas in many ways. So come all ye faithful. And it naturally draws us in. And my hope tonight is to draw us deeper and deeper into the depths of the riches of God's goodness and grace that are really proclaimed very loud and very clearly in this Christmas hymn. Now, the song itself actually has a pretty unclear origin. It's not uh, fully agreed upon who wrote it. It's typically attributed to a man named John Francis Wade, who lived in 18th century England and then in France, and he was a copyist by trade, and uh, so he copied manuscripts by hand. And he was famous for his artistic calligraphy, which gained him some acclaim and some success, and he had a knack for copying music. And in 1750, he placed this very hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful, into a manuscript he was copying for the English Roman Catholic College in Lisbon, Portugal. And then it was over 30 years later, in 1785, that it was sent to the Portuguese chapel in London, where the Duke of Leeds heard it sung. He loved it, and so he put it into the repertoire of his singers, and it was from there that it finally began to start to spread. 
Originally, it was written in Latin. Um, Wade wrote the whole song in Latin. You probably know the Latin title, Adeste Fideles. And it had four stanzas originally. And over the years, um, you've probably seen a number have been added to it, different ones, but we're going to deal with the four that are original. But the origin is not really the focus uh, this evening. The most important aspect of the song is what it tells us and what it calls us to. It's an invitation, quite simply, to come and adore Jesus Christ the Lord. Come and adore our Savior. As you sing the song, it generally follows Luke's account of the birth of Jesus. And I I want you to listen to Luke 2, starting in verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Now, the first stanza of our song echoes these truths. We hear this call to come to Bethlehem, to come to where the king has been born. It's a call to those who are faithful and triumphant. And actually, as I was studying the song a little bit more, and the more I read and and, and thought about it, the more that that call in in verse 1 actually to me seems to be a call to the angels. A call to the angels. It's a call to them to come and see and behold the Lord, the incarnate God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, or chapter 2 actually, verse, verse 12, the good news of the gospel is said to be that into which the angels long to look. They long to look. These, these beings who have no need of a Savior, they long to see the work of God to save lost sinners. They're the joyful, the the triumphant, and and in their witnessing of God's great work of redemption, they rejoice. But as that first verse ends, we come to the chorus that calls to us all to come and adore Him, to come and adore Christ the Lord. That's our privilege. It's our delight. He's the Lord. He's God Himself. And that is what this song truly celebrates. And then we come to the second stanza, and it's one I'm not sure we've ever sung in this church before. I don't think we have. It's it's not one that you, you hear a lot. It's not easily sung, and it's not based directly from Scripture, but it is certainly scriptural. Its message is almost taken verbatim from the Nicene Creed of the year 325. And in that creed, Christians confess this belief in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. We sing true God of true God, light of of light eternal. Hebrews 1, 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This child born is God himself. He is the eternal God. John 8, 12 says as well, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This one that we come to adore is God himself. This baby is God himself, the exalted God. And then the verse turns to, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. Very God, begotten, not created. It goes from this heights of the exaltation that is true God of true God, light of light eternal to, he humbles himself to the virgin's womb. The second person of the Trinity 
became a baby. You know, every king before was, event, was before that a baby. This is the only king who then became a baby. This is the mystery of the incarnation. And as you sing this, the response, again, it, it takes you to these heights of who this baby is, and then it just immediately calls you, oh, come, let us adore him. Well, then we come to the third stanza, echoing Luke 2, 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The proclamation of the multitude of the heavenly host, actually the vast army of God, probably hundreds of thousands or more, they're declaring and singing the praise of this child born in Bethlehem. They're saying, glory to God, to the highest degree imaginable. Give him glory. He is beyond, uh, beyond any glory we could give. The birth of Jesus, the coming of the Christ, again, is the radiance of the glory of God. And then finally, we come to the last stanza. We greet the Lord, God in flesh, born this happy morning. Sing word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here's the core doctrine core and central belief of Christmas, God come in the flesh, the, the eternal word come in the flesh. Just ponder the magnitude of that for a moment. The word of God, the eternal God who was in the beginning, who created all things, who holds all things together by the very word of his power. He humbled himself to take on created human flesh to save his people from their sins. And folks, if that doesn't scream, oh, come, let us adore him, I'm not sure what will. And our adoration, that adoring of Christ the Savior, must involve more than just singing. It involves lives surrendered to him. It involves repentance and belief. It involves understanding why God would go to such lengths. He did so because without this blessed miracle of the incarnation, we would all remain in our sin and be completely and utterly lost. But the good news of Christmas, why we celebrate, is that if we repent and believe, we'll be with the one who did this for all eternity. Our sins will be taken care of because the second person of the Trinity condescended to take on flesh for sinners just like you and me. And folks, we will not only join with the angels in singing, but with the choir of all God's redeemed children over all time, singing praise and giving glory to Christ the Lord. You might think our singing here can, can be beautiful, and it, it, it can, but imagine God's children and the choirs of angels singing. put another thing with this, and I think about it in relation to just life in general. Christ came not only to save us, but to set in motion the reversal of the pain and heartache and the difficulty that we've all felt in a slightly different way than normal this year. So let that draw you as well to the one who came for the hurting, for the broken, for the rebellious, because in him not only can the wounded be healed, the blind see, the oppressed set free, but the sinner declared righteous. So, O come, let us adore him, 
Christ the Lord. As we sing this song now in just a moment, may the words take on a little bit of, of that depth of meaning that is, the song is meant to convey. May you find and, and see and sing of the true beauty of what we celebrate, not only every Christmas, but really every moment of every day of our lives as believers. Believers in this child who was born to give his life for us and who will come again. And he will set everything right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth, this glorious truth, this message of grace and of hope. In so many ways, this incomprehensible truth of the one who took on flesh, God eternal, so that we could be with you for all eternity. Come, let us adore him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Oh, come, all ye faithful.